well worth buying and reading. And then I want to go on and show the links to Cuba and then talk a bit more about the Cuban situation itself. I think I'm going to make four or five points about the book. First, I think what's good is that on the one hand, Jeff, um, if you like, criticizes those people like Rory Carroll, the um, Guardian journalist, who denies any real gains being made by the Venezuelan people under, or any, any real positive aspects of Chavism at all. And he, he really skewers him in the book. It's a really good passage where he takes on Carroll and, and uh, dissects him. And on, on the other hand, there's also, uh, if you like, uh, sort of implicit criticism all through the book of any sort of uncritical support of these governments. And even in this country, we can see that groups like Social Action or the Morning Star or some of the Solidarity campaigns tend to take a very uncritical view of the processes that took place in the last period. So, for example, when the, the constitutional coup took place in Brazil, they correctly condemned that, but they didn't actually make any analysis of, of the unpopularity of the PT or the problems of the PT. So, it was, if you like, they uh, tended to just look at it in terms of a sort of campism, if you like. They didn't take into account the fact you have to, as Jeff explains in his book, take into, into account the, the working masses in the countryside, in the town, the informed workers, the workers, the uh, national bourgeoisies, and also imperialism. What tends to happen in some of their analyses is that they just look at the conflict between sort of all powerful American imperialism and the governments. And I think that's a wrong way of looking. I think it's quite good in the book that that's, that's uh, done. Um, I think it's also interesting to link this discussion about what's happening in Latin America to the debate we're having at the moment about the international situation and whether there's uh, uh, what, what's the nature of any offensive by the right wing. Is there a shift internationally? Is there, there's obviously been an offensive internationally by the right, but it's not all finished. There's a polarisation as we've seen in Brazil, Argentina recently with big demonstrations. Um, the other good thing about the book is there's lots of facts and figures. You need to have proper data when you're discussing with people, trying to win them over. It's no good just having good ideas. There are lots of very useful sources and facts. But at the same time, they're located with an overall theoretical framework, which I think is very important. So um, Jeff mentioned um, the question of compensatory states, but also he talks about extractive capitalism. And I think that's, that's a good link up there with the work that uh, Naomi, is it Wolf? She does in the ecological thing, yeah? Claim, that's right. Um, and that's, that's an important concept that we don't necessarily use much in this country, but it's important for understanding uh, elsewhere in the world. Also this idea of passive revolution, transformismo, that's important as well. He talks about the, some of these Gramscian ideas, yeah, about the idea of a passive revolution. The idea, in other words, that you can have changes that have conservative aspects and transform, transformationary aspects at the same time, and one can win out of the other. And I think that's an important idea which we could possibly use here as well. But one in particular I liked a lot, I think will be worth looking into more for people, is this idea based on some of the analysis of, of the Peruvian Marxist uh, Maria Tegui, which is this idea about the utopian uh, socialist dialectic between the past and the future. In other words, looking at some of the forms of communal living that existed in the indigenous cultures and linking this with the idea of a socialist future. I think it's a very positive way of looking at it. It gets over this problem of, if you like, the economistic, uh, evolutionist, if you like, uh, industrialist uh, approach of traditional Marxism, which is very important. And also this idea of logic of accumulation by dispossession, another important concept. So all these things are worth looking at in the book and learning. I also like the fact that all this stuff was linked to some living people. And in the book, there's two very good um, pen pictures, you'd like, of activist leaders, one called Macas in Ecuador, another guy called Quispy in Bolivia. And I think it's very good reading that bit of the book to see the real flesh and blood of people struggling in these movements and what they did and, and the political choice they made. It's not just a sort of uh, fan club type thing, but looking at the choices they made. And finally, I think it's quite useful for students, this book, because in, in universities, I know, they tend to give you all sorts of readings by sociologists who give a certain, and economists who give a certain uh, analysis of the Latin American social formation. And Jeff actually takes it up very clearly and, and goes in detail through some of these analyses and shows where they're limited and, and not helpful. Okay. Um, also, finally, there's a thing about, which I think is quite links in with Podemos in Spain as well, because there's a whole part in the book where he looks at um, uh, the guy who wrote the book on Chavez, Chicharelli, 
and he's talked a lot about the people and using that as a, as a concept. And just as with some of the analyses by um, Erehan in, in, um, in Podemos, they, they, they use the ideas of Laclau, and it's also it's often very woolly and not really very helpful in the end. And I think that's, that's quite an interesting part of the book. But moving on to Cuba, um, what's interesting in Cuba, I've, I've been there three times now over the last 10 years, and we went in September. And if you go to see Che's monuments in Santa Clara, which is a very inspiring monument, a huge monument on the hill outside Santa Clara, with a huge statue and quite an interesting museum in there, just beside a massive poster, massive billboard, all about Chavez. So they, the Cubans put Chavez more or less on the same level as Che, you know. And that's interesting. It shows you the way they see the, all these uh, <coughs> movements in Latin America being positive for them. And also, if you look at Granma, it has a regular thing on Chavismo. In, in the, there's a regular sort of feature about Chavez thinking. Because you've got to understand that these leaders were inspired by Cuba. It, it wasn't an accident. If, if Cuba hadn't been there, you could ask yourself how far these, these, these uh, uh, leaders might have gone. I mean, they probably would have gone anyway, but you know what I mean? They, 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 they themselves say they were inspired by Fidel and the revolution. And, of course, quite correctly, and it would be, be a wrong and, and stupid for Cuba not to welcome these progressive governments. Even if some of these progressive governments weren't so left, it was correct from their point of view in terms of the survival of the Cuban revolution to welcome these, these changes. And, of course, the oil deals with the Venezuelan government has been particularly important. I mean, Cuba basically sends hundreds of doctors to these places and in exchange get deals on, on oil. And literally, the lights would have gone out in Cuba without the Venezuelan oil. And in fact, the lights are going out now in Cuba because it's a crisis with Venezuelan oil. I just read a piece in Grama, or not in Grama, in one of the blogs talking about that recently. Because after the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89, there was a special period. And it is remarkable, actually, that Cuba survived that because if you look at the record of all the East European states, most of them collapsed into gangster uh, capitalism. That didn't happen in Cuba. It was a terrible period. People were literally hungry. Uh, you know, very, very poor diet in, in that period. And um, so, uh, and, and people, sh people getting through that and having the possibility of getting help from Venezuela was very, very important indeed. Um, and of course, now they're talking about a perfect storm economically in Cuba developing in the next six months because of these, this problem of the fall in the uh, commodity prices and the cutting of uh, the oil from the, the less uh, oil from Venezuela. Because Venezuela itself recently has had problems in providing the oil to its own people. If you look at the, the Garden article the other day. Um, now, what's interesting is the way the um, Cubans themselves see this cycle in, in Latin America. Because the other day in Granma, there was an article by the culture minister where he talks about the uh, glorious uh, moments of the left in Latin America, in our America, with this movement. Okay? And uh, it talks about Evo Morales' career and also includes Daniel Ortega, a bit more debatable, and the formation of ARB and the fact that that enabled them to. Um, override the American free trade thing, the, the, the trade agreement, the R ALCA. And then it talks about uh, the uh, Nesta Kitchener and everybody else, and, and also the party, the, uh, the Brazilian PT. And his analysis, it disconverted America, Latin America into a, into a pole of attraction. And he then goes on to critique those people who talk about a pendulum and a pendulum swinging from the left back to the right. And he talks, he says it's a locura, it's a man that's taught like this, because it doesn't work, history doesn't work by pendulum swings. And then he goes on to talk about how women, men and peoples make history, and that we have to get over this demoralization, we have to uh, have right ideas and uh, fight for our, uh, to change this round. It's interesting because it's a sort of, moralistic half recognition of the problems but without really providing any analysis one way or the other about the reality of that of that uh, those governments and what to do now so th this is very typical of Cuban uh, ways of approaching these problems there's no real analysis of strategy or problems you, you know so 
if you look at Cuba today, it, obviously its political situation starts from a different place because Cuba's a non-capitalist society, it's what we might call a transitional society. Um, it's certainly not capitalist in my opinion. Uh, and it, it, it's quite different to the, 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 the governments of Maduro or um, Morales insofar as it, in Cuba there's real total control of state power. Whereas in these other countries, <laughs> the, the governments are in government, but they don't really have power in the sense of controlling the, the means of production. That is the case in Cuba. So there are different problems, a different cycle involved, okay? Uh, and I think uh, if you look at Cuba today, it is uh, got huge problems economically. I mean, uh, in terms of the basic living standards, food production, there are different figures between 50 and 60, 70 percent of food is imported. And if you go to Cuba, what you notice is an awful lot of land that is lying fallow. In fact, this whole problem in this, this macumbo, this, uh, this shrub stuff, is growing everywhere in Cuba because the, the, the land isn't cultivated enough. There's huge problems with housing. If you go to Havana, if you go outside the, uh, the tourist areas, you'll see that the state of housing is very bad indeed. And of course, the big problem is very low wages, and uh, particularly in the state sector. And what you've got is low productivity. And the, the other major, major problem, which overrides everything else, is that with the boom in tourism and in remittances from people working abroad, there's a large number of dollars coming over. And in Cuba, people with dollars are relatively well off. Because if you look at it, if you're a, a person who owns a bed and breakfast, and there's been a huge development of bed and breakfasts um, in the last few years, in one night, the tourist pays $25 a room, but you don't get paid in a month $25. So you can see that the scale of differences. And that creates tremendous tension. Um, and if you talk to people in Cuba, talk to teachers in particular, uh, who have stopped being teachers and become guides and guide you around, or taxi drivers who used to be professionals, they will tell you it, it's very, very difficult, very difficult without having access to dollars. And so the big problem is how you can actually move forward on this. And the Cubans are discussing this, and one thing they're doing is trying to move away from total state control of the economy. And they're right on this. I think we shouldn't be sectarian or stupid about this. It's stupid to have every single area of the economy controlled by the state. Small-scale production, small businesses are perfectly compatible with a movement towards socialism and maintaining the possibility of further moves to socialism. Sam Farber, in his work on Cuba, I think, explains that quite well. You do need some of that. I mean, you have a situation where all the hairdressers are, are state employees or all the electricians or all the plumbers. It's ridiculous, really. But, of course, that move to more self-employed people has caused problems because uh, not everybody can work properly as a self-employed person if the logistics in the economy don't work either. And we, we talked to a few people, I remember in the taxi, in our car one time, the, one of the carpenters we go lift to was going about 100 kilometres to get some wood because the problem was the state still controlled the supply of wood. So you could become a carpenter but you were still tied in to the relatively inefficient state procedures for providing all this stuff and that was a big problem so that's one of the one of the issues so it's correct to open up but the problem, obviously the problem is how do you manage the system so you control the development of the new uh, business people because uh, we met one person in our, in our bed and breakfast who um, uh, unlike most of the times we went before already owned two or three bed and breakfasts through his family because what happens you, you use your cousin to to buy another one. He, and you get to a situation now where it's not the family there who's running it, but people are employed by the family who are running the bed and breakfast. That's the development. So there is a real development there. The other problem with the remittances is that it has a moral aspect, this, because I talked to somebody who said, she said to us, well, the problem is all these people just live off the money they get from Cuba, from the States. And that's not good from the point of view of, sounds a bit traditional, but work ethic in a sense of community. You know, you're, you're sort of separate from the, and that's another problem, okay? So the, the, government, the government has said they want to unify the economy, uh, unify the currencies, so that there won't be two currencies. But it's quite hard to say how you do that without big uh, increase in productivity and reorganisation. Another problem for the economy is that the big size of the non-productive apparatus, the fact that because of the blockade, because of the aggression of Americans before, there's grown up a huge uh, state apparatus, the police, the army and all that. Is, and essentially, it's not productive, that. you know, And that's a problem. How do you shift it? And also, you get the impression that 
we talk to a few police people, and they don't work very long weeks, these people, some of them. They, it's a fairly short week. And of course, that's the other problem of the, the fact that wages are so low, both in the countryside and also in the town. Because, for example, we talked to a few farmers who produce coffee, and the problem was the price the government gave them for their coffee was so low, they had no incentive to incre increase the production. And of course, the people in the town will always tell you that the government pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. And, and that's true as well. And, and there's also a petty corruption that exists in the, uh, in, the, in the economy, which isn't the same as the high level corruption you see in Russia in these places, but it's a corruption of nicking, the, um, nicking bits and pieces from your work. It's like pill for all time. You go to any hotel, we went to a hotel recently, and um, there was no mint for the mojitos. And that's, it, it, there's mint everywhere in Cuba. So obviously what happened, the, the guys had nicked the mint to sell to local bars. It, it's absolutely classic. And that's the problem. How do you overcome those sorts of problems? But, am I finished now? But that's the last word. On the debates gone on in Cuba, because it's important to understand, um, there are more and more debates going on in Cuba, and I was surprised looking on the internet just recently and following up some of the leads from Jeanette Helbel's articles about this. There is debate going on. There's debate, there's social democratic positions on the shift, the transition. There are people clearly, I think, I guess that's probably a key sector of the, of the leadership, who wants a Chinese-Vietnam transition. There was an article just the other day in Grama talking about a visit by the, uh, one of the army chiefs to Vietnam, and he says in this that um, uh, your experience in Vietnam is very important in terms of actualizing our, our, our economy. So that's a clear comment. There's also left positions, something called like Pedro Campos, Campos who's, who writes for Havana, um, what name? Havana Times, that's it, and other people like that who put forward a, a, a socialist or a Marxist opposition. There's anarchists as well. So there is a range. The problem is how much weight these small forces have in relation to the weight of the central core leadership and their control over the population as a whole in terms of monopoly of the means of expression. And that's, a key, that's why I think for us we have to be in solidarity with the Cuban Revolution against the blockade, to lift the blockade, but also in favour of a socialist democracy, a vast democracy, because otherwise even the economic problems can't be sold.